Hey everyone, my name is Clay Robbins and I work on growth here at ZeroX and I'm excited to talk to you today about a trend that I call automated finance and how it can enable developers to build the next wave of user experiences that help make DeFi accessible. And so before we get started on automated finance, I wanted to take a second to talk about ZeroX, what we do uh, and how we do it um, for those who don't know who we are. And so uh, we are a decentralized exchange protocol built on top of Ethereum that enables any developer anywhere in the world to build exchange functionality into their products and services with just a few lines of code. And since we launched back in August of 2017, we've enabled over 100 different teams to be build, begin building products with ZeroX's exchange functionality. And those 100 projects have gone on to securely exchange over a billion dollars in assets across 1,400 different asset types or token types. And I think that last point is extremely important to note because if you think about exchange as this universal function that underpins a whole set of different use cases across open finance as well as ancillary verticals like video games, the opportunity to not only tokenize value but also exchange it really is boundless. Uh, and we're excited to be the canonical solution for developers to add that exchange functionality to their products and services. And so before we talk about automated finance, I think it's important to set the context for where we've been um, and with it respect to financial markets and exchange. So um, not too long ago, uh, exchange and, and marketplaces looked a lot like this. They were extremely analog with guys on ladders posting bid ask quotes on a wall at some irregular interval, um, set of intervals. We had people yelling and exchanging paper certificates because those were the vehicles for exchange. Um, and I suppose to be taken seriously in an exchange venue like this, you had to go and get yourself a fedora so that people knew that you were there to conduct some serious business. And so the net result here is, you know, it's extremely inefficient, uh, it's extremely inaccessible, and the opportunity for middlemen to assess fees on these transactions was extremely high. So now fast forward about 50 years to the 1980s and the dawn of the digital age, and now uh, manual analog bid ask quotes have been replaced by displays on rudimentary computers and shouting and verbal exchange is reduced to a minimum because those orders can now be filled on these computers. Uh, paper certificates are being replaced by bits and bytes on new and early databases built by companies like Oracle. Uh, and the net result here is the marketplace becomes a little bit more efficient, a little bit more accessible, but the types of assets that can be accessed are still relatively limited. So fast forward another 40 years and we are where we are today where our preferred venue for exchange is on web or on mobile through an application like Robinhood that I think we'd all argue is much more efficient than, um, than previous exchange venues that we just highlighted. But I think there's still some shortcomings with respect to where we are today, uh, one of which is accessibility. If you think about marketplaces on a global scale, things like Robinhood are still only accessible to a few um, people in specific jurisdictions. So you probably have to be a US citizen with a US bank account or in some other first world country to access the assets on these platforms. And those types of assets that are available and the functionality associated with those assets is limited too. Um, you, on Robinhood, you only have access to equities and now crypto, um, but it's simple buy functionality, uh, buy sell functionality, as well as options um, and maybe a little bit of margin trading. Um, and the final piece here is with respect to the ability to assess fees. While um, Robinhood and other platforms like it are free to access and use, and there's no upfront transactional fees, users still may pay a fee on the back end in the form of something like a spread where someone else in the marketplace for the same asset may be getting a better price than you are. Um, so this cost of convenience is passed along um, while it may not be an upfront fee. And so where do we go from here? Well, enter DeFi uh, or decentralized finance, which I think is a great moniker or descriptor for the space that encompasses a whole host of different underlying financial primitives that enable any developer anywhere in the world to construct markets, products, and services that are complex, even relative to today's standards, that are permissionless, meaning they're accessible to everyone, and that can be used at a significantly reduced cost relative to other traditional financial intermediaries and markets. And so some of those key primitives today that exist are things like exchange, like 0x, payments, lending and credit, identity, derivatives, and insurance. And that number of primitives continues to grow, so this is just a small snapshot of, of what exists today. And I think while we're still early in this space, 
Um, there are signs that we're starting to move out of what, what we call the toy phase, um, one of which is $700 million in value is locked up in these different applications and protocols, which shows that, again, we're starting to move from the toy phase and mature uh, in the context of this technology. And so within decentralized finance, we have what I'm calling automated finance, which is the abstraction of complex financial transactions into trustless, acceptable user experiences. And from a developer standpoint, I think this is extremely important because what automated finance is at its core is taking actions that are normally conducted by users and moving them to be executed by smart contract logic. And so for this space, De DeFi or open finance to continue to mature, I think this is a key trend um, that developers need to be cognizant of in building products and services. So to jump into a few different examples of automated finance, the first of which is DYDX, which is a margin trading protocol and exchange venue that allows users to speculate on the future price movements of Ethereum-based assets. So for example, if I thought the price of Ethereum was going to move from $100 to $105, and I have $100 worth of ETH, DYDX enables me to take up to a 4x leverage position, so in this case it would be a leverage long position on Ethereum, which allows me to capture greater upside to this prospective trade than I would just taking um, the, the position with just the assets that I have. And this sounds extremely complex, right? But it really isn't, because um, DYDX has, from a user perspective, made it as easy as push button and get leverage, which I think, which I think is extremely powerful uh, in the context of different financial products. And so, what does this look like on the back end? Well, it all starts with the user taking the action of pushing the button and agreeing to the margin terms. And so, in this case, it's a 4x leverage long position on Ethereum uh, with $100 of ETH. And so, that ETH is locked up in DYDX's contracts as collateral. And then the contract on the user's behalf goes out and borrows the requisite assets needed, so in this case, DAI, um, to continue to build that, that 4x leverage position. Once they've borrowed the DAI, then DYDX's contract goes out to a liquidity source like 0x's network liquidity pool and exchanges that DAI for ETH to continue complete the, the build of that position. And so what you have as a net result is the user with one click of a button in a couple of seconds has a 4x leverage long position on Ethereum, which I think is pretty awesome. The next example that I wanted to touch on is a product called CDP Saver that is a collateralized debt management platform that enables users to, again, push a button and actually reduce the risk of adverse outcomes associated with managing collateralized debt positions in the MakerDAO ecosystem. Um, so those adverse things could be something like liquidation. And so CDP Saver um, has a product called Repay that enables um, any user uh, to press a button and reduce the risk of liquidation. And so what this looks like on the back end is the user, again, just pushes a button and takes the action of um, wanting to increase their collateralization ratio on their CDP because maybe in the market the Ethereum price is decreasing, which means that uh, the guy that just opened up that margin trade is probably not too happy. But um, anyway, uh, they want to increase the collateralization ratio on their CDP. So what they do is they push that button, um, the CDP saver contract on the user's behalf withdraws some of the DAI from the CDP, and then again goes out to a liquidity source. So in this context, again, it's 0x's network liquidity. And uh, in the inverse of what DYX is, DYDX was doing is exchanging Ethereum for DAI, and then using that DAI to repay some of the, the debt um, that's uh, associated with that CDP, which increases the collateralization ratio and decreases the risk of liquidation. And so what you have uh, here is, again, another complex financial transaction being abstracted away um, from a user to just uh, and distilled down into a single click, which is, which is great. And this is actually going to get better um, because today CDP Saver is working on a new product um, in conjunction with Repay that allows users to set a lower bound collateralization ratio that they're comfortable with. Um, and if the price of Ethereum decreases to the point that that collateralization ratio, um, that lower bound threshold is breached, then the contracts will uh, automatically do all of these transactions on behalf of the user. So no user interaction is actually even needed, which again, I think is awesome. 
And so within DeFi and within automated finance, there's another term I wanted to highlight, which is contract fillable liquidity, which I believe is the engine that powers automated finance. And so at its core, what contract fillable liquidity is, is it's the uh, programmatic swapping of tokens um, by smart contracts rather than humans. And so this makes a lot of sense, right? Why would you have a user interact with half a dozen MetaMask pop-ups when you can just delegate that responsibility to a machine um, that's much more efficient in, in, in uh, executing these different types of transactions? And this doesn't have to be, be terribly complex. Um, for example, in, in the context of buying uh, a great piece of land in the, uh, the game Decentraland or the virtual world Decentraland, um, a user uh, has to have the requisite asset, which is mana, to purchase this land. So for this central plaza estate, you need a certain amount of mana, but what you see in the wallet uh, displayed here is that um, that amount of mana is not sufficient to purchase that land parcel. Um, however, the user does have a bit of ETH in their wallet, so they could build up enough mana um, in the wallet to actually make that purchase. And so without contract fillable liquidity, what the user would have to do is go out to a decentralized exchange or God forbid a centralized exchange and exchange that Ethereum for mana, come back to the Decentraland platform and execute that purchase. And if this is a great piece of land or if there's a auction, uh, an auction being conducted, um, that land could be gone before that transaction is complete. And so with contract fillable liquidity, um, all of this can be automated with a single click. So users purchase, push the button that says buy land. The contracts um, swap that ETH for mana using, again, a, a liquidity source like 0x. Um, you, and then take that uh, new resulting mana and purchase the land on the user's behalf, all while the user remains in the same uh, experience or, or same interface, which, again, increases efficiency and allows users to execute transactions um, with just a single click as opposed to multiple interactions. The final example that I wanted to cover is what's called atomic risk-free arbitrage um, that we see is the majority of, um, of contract fillable liquidity volume today. And what that means is that you have different types of exchange, uh, decentralized exchange protocols like 0x, uh, Kyber or, or something like Uniswap. Um, and oftentimes across these different platforms, there are price inefficiencies. And so what um, many of these arbitrage bots are doing is interacting with each of these contracts to atomically, without any latency, um, take advantage of these price inefficiencies, which may, which may be as small as a few cents, in order to profit um, on these uh, nascent inefficient markets. So in this example here, what we have is we have um, a difference in price across Kyber and Uniswap for the BAT token, and you can see the series of um, contracts uh, that are being interacted with that allow for this bot to take advantage of this, uh, this arbitrage opportunity. Now, while this does represent the majority of contract fillable liquidity volume today, uh, we believe that as n other use cases like the Decentraland example that I gave or like margin trading with DYDX or uh, collateralized debt management platforms like CDP Saver continue to proliferate, that uh, the markets in which those tokens exist become more efficient and the opportunities for arbitrage decrease. So uh, while this is the, the core use case today, I think um, that it'll go by the wayside here in the near future. So to wrap things up, I wanted to leave you with a, a piece of review and then a couple of pieces of advice in the context of developing with contract fillable liquidity. Um, the first is that automated finance is what makes DeFi uh, accessible and contract fillable liquidity is what powers token abstraction. And so from a developer standpoint, what, you'd like, what you should be focusing on is the desired outcome that you're working to achieve with a given action that a user is taking and then use that to inform the underlying infrastructure or smart contracts that you're going to interact with um, when building your products and services. And then the last point I think goes without saying is machines are much more efficient than humans so any chance that you have to delegate an action or responsibility to a smart contract that means that the user doesn't have to take that action the better. Um, and so uh, to wrap things up uh, really excited about what automated finance is as a trend within decentralized finance. And at Zero X, we're specifically excited about contract fillable liquidity. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work to build out documentation and libraries that allow uh, developers to easily call Zero X's liquidity to power these different automated processes associated with um, building products and services within open finance or DeFi. And I'm happy to talk to anyone out there that is excited about the opportunity or just wants to learn more. So feel free 
free to reach out to me at clay at zeroxproject.com or on Twitter, which actually may be a little bit faster, at Krabby Lions. So thanks for listening and look forward to hearing from you.